everyone, welcome back to my channel. I know I haven't been making uh, as many videos as I'd like, but if you saw one of my last videos, the one that says big news, I am currently working on my first book and time's a ticking. I only have about mm, six months left. Luckily, I am about halfway through, but yeah, I still have half a book to go. So that's what I've been doing. But honestly, I've really missed you and getting new comments and just putting out videos. I thought I would just do a video answering some of the questions that I found on Personal Finance Canada Reddit. So if you wanna know what questions I'm answering, just look in the description. I've got them all as chapters, so you can take a look and choose the ones that you would like to know the answers to. The first question I have is how much should I set aside for taxes if I am self-employed. I was planning on setting aside 40% of my billable amount. Am I in the right ballpark with that amount? Let me know. So if you're setting aside 40% of your income for income taxes, likely you're gonna save enough, but there are some things you do need to know. Honestly, what I tell everyone, because I get a lot of these questions, really just use a tax calculator. And also, I'd also recommend maybe one of my budget spreadsheets for self-employed people that will help you determine what is your projected business revenue minus kind of your projected business expenses. And then you can kind of take a look at maybe some past years or what you believe will be your average tax rate. It'll give you a clear idea of how much you should be setting aside. Next question is for couples that use proportional income for shared expenses, do you use gross or net income? Personally, I would just go with net because that is actually how much you both are taking home. But there is one thing that you should think about. If you, for example, have a pension with your work or a group RRSP and then money is taken off your paycheck and going directly into those programs, so you are saving for retirement, that's not really uh, accounted for when you're using your net income as that split to determine who should contribute how much for the household expenses. So with that, instead of doing just a straight up, you know, 60-40 split, maybe you want to take a look at how much are you contributing to your RRSP and then changing the ratio of who contributes what to the household expenses to make sure that your partner also has enough to put towards their retirement savings as well. All right, the next question is is what investment should I choose to put inside my FHSA? Here's the thing, whenever it comes to asking a question like, what should I put inside this investment account? That actually shouldn't be your first question. It actually should be, what is this account for? What's my time horizon? What's my risk tolerance? What are the criteria for this particular goal that I am using this investment account for? So for example, if you're gonna use your FHSA and you are saving to buy a home and you plan on buying a home in two years time, so very, very quickly, it's probably not a good idea to buy a bunch of stocks or have an all equity portfolio of ETFs. That would be very volatile and we just have no idea what's going to go on with the stock market in the next two years. You want to make sure you are invested in something very conservative or just keep things in there like cash or GICs that will not fluctuate that much in the next two years. But if you have a much longer time horizon, let's say you want to take 10 years to save up, absolutely you can invest in something a little bit more risky because you have that run way to kind of uh, recover if there is a really big dip in the market and, you know, it takes a couple of years to get back up to that level that you need it to be. I have a bunch of videos on investing, especially with ETFs, so I will uh, drop them in the description here so you can take a look. Also, I should mention, I do have an investing course. It's called Wealth Building Blueprint for Canadians. It is just about passive investing. So if you're a boring index investor like myself, but you also don't know how the hell to do that and you want a very comprehensive course all about building wealth for the long term using index funds. Uh, well, you know, I've got a course all about it. I've had it for over two years now. So make sure to check it out. Again, I will drop a link in the description so you can check it out after this video. Speaking of homes, there's one really interesting question I saw, which is just, I bought a house, now what? What should I do? And they were kind of asking, should we get disability and life insurance? Um, because now we have this mortgage. And also, is there a really big difference between choosing accelerated weekly versus accelerated bi-weekly payments? So first and foremost, absolutely, I mean, even if you don't own a home, you should have life insurance. I'm a big fan of term life insurance. I kind of hate permanent life insurance. I think it is kind of a scam, but term life insurance, so much more affordable, and it really does what it's supposed to do, which is to cover you during your really expensive years of, you know, just like being low income, paying off your student loans, starting a family, all this kind of stuff. And then hopefully when the term is over, you will have enough assets to cover you in case your partner dies. You're gonna be in a much better position and you won't 
need that life insurance payout. But if you just bought a house, likely you're in that kind of life stage where things are expensive. So definitely get a life insurance policy. Also too, like for example, we had a life insurance policy when we owned our townhouse and then when we bought our house and it would not cover the, you know, uh, outstanding balance if my husband died, we had to get a second policy. And so that might be something that you have to do. Maybe you already have a life insurance policy. If it does not cover your full mortgage plus some, because you may need to supplement your income because your partner is no longer there to provide an income, definitely look into getting a second policy. Now, the other question was a pretty, you know, simple, but also good question. Is there really that big of a difference between accelerated weekly, accelerated biweekly payments? In general, you are going to be saving a little bit more money choosing accelerated weekly payments because you're paying down the principal more frequently. And so it will build up less interest over time compared to accelerated biweekly. That being said, it's not really a big difference depending on how much your mortgage is, especially too, if you're an employee and you work somewhere and you get paid biweekly, it might just be easier to budget that way. That's what we did for a, a long while. Um, but you know, you will save a little bit money doing accelerated biweekly, but I'm gonna include a link to another article that I saw online that kind of breaks it down. Lots of great comparisons and charts and some calculations that you can take a look at if you want to deep dive on this topic. So the next question is, are there any drawbacks to increasing your credit limit? Not necessarily. It can actually help you improve your credit score because if you are always getting past that 30% of your credit utilization, which, you know, kind of signals to the credit bureaus and lenders that, oh, maybe you're a bit overextended and they don't like that. If you increase your credit limit, then your credit utilization will increase. And then your, you know, credit score may go up because you will look less risky. With that said, though, there is also a downside to having too much credit. Sometimes if you have too much available credit, lenders and the bureaus will also think you are overextended. Not a good look. So it's also bad to have too much credit. I would say the only kind of negative thing of increasing your credit is that it may incentivize you to spend more on credit. Spend more money than maybe you have. It's just, it's one of those things. We're all human. If it's there, we may touch it. So you just got to really recognize if I have more credit, will I use it? And will I be in a worse position financially? If you feel like, yeah, that's probably the case, then you may want to just not accept that offer of more credit. Okay, next question is, can you switch credit cards with the same bank, but switch it to a different product without a credit check? That is a really great question. Let me kind of explain how this works. Let's say you have a credit card with BMO. It's a no fee card. There's not a lot of, you know, rewards or cash back. You don't love it. Um, but you see that they have this other card that has much better rewards maybe there's an annual fee, but you don't mind paying that because of all the extra benefits that you're going to get. Instead of closing your first card and then applying for that next card, which the closing of that card and the application for a new card will lower your credit score, you can simply call their credit card service department and ask to switch products. So get on the phone with somebody and ask them, hey, I've got this credit card. I want to upgrade to this other card. I want to do this while preserving my credit history from that previous card because maybe you've had it for a number of years. And also I want to make sure that we are not closing that card. We are not opening up a new card. We are just switching it to a new card. So there's not going to be a new credit application and thus ding my credit score. I'd say the only downside of doing this is if there is a really great sign up bonus for the card you're upgrading to, you may not be eligible for it or you may not get the full bonus. So that's something really important to ask them while you're on the phone with them. Can I also make sure I'm getting that sign up bonus? So that is it for this video. Um, and if you liked this video, let me know because then I can do more of these kind of Q&A type of videos. They're a lot of fun for me, very easy for me to do because I know all the answers, but it's hard for me to think of topics and questions. So let me know if you enjoyed this. So that's it for me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in my next video.